Well, thank you so much for the invitation. I'm extremely um, excited to be here today. In terms of uh, political art, the question is what is art for? Um, why? Because I think part of what we have to do as political artists is before we do any image, before we start creating any object, is to understand what is the role we're going to assign art in society. What are the functions and the elements we think art can activate um, in society? Uh, which is not a given. It's something each artist has to find um, on, its, on its own. Usually when you talk about political art, there are one or two uh, given options. One is uh, the kind of propaganda option, which is uh, how can you basically control the meaning of an image? You know, we know that part of the problem with representation is that interpretation can be an endless game um, that is actually being pursued by the people in power. So you can do something extremely, um, let's say, transgressive in your view, but then you can have somebody who reinterpret and have more power to, to disseminate a different meaning. So basically, you have that option. Or you have the option to laugh about it, you know? You have the option to do something like this, <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um, decide that, what the hell, let's take away the burden um, of, uh, let's take away their power, basically. And I'm more interested in that. I have done both because I think, um, as an artist, I'm trying to understand systems. I'm trying to understand how systems work in order for me to infiltrate the system and blow them up, or at least destabilizing them or make them as nervous as they, as they make me. So basically, um, that's what I'm trying to do. One of the things that for me is most important as an artist is uh, the idea of language. How do we address what we're doing? And um, I think, for me, it's extremely important the fact that this, the, the aesthetics that we're using for political art is also being challenged. <coughs> Why? Because I think um, not only you have to learn the language of the people you are going to confront, not only you have to, to learn the language in order for them to feel they've been talking to, because sometimes we say, oh, we're doing political art, but it's only like three artists in the corner somewhere thinking they're but they're talking to each other mainly, you know? So how can you talk to the people in power? How can you co-opt the language? And I think part of this is done by proposing new aesthetical paradigms. Aesthetical paradigms, in my view, that is hard for them to co-opt. For me, as an artist, that's a challenge. How can I do an artwork that is hard to co-opt by the people in power? Um, and hopefully hard to understand while everybody's laughing about it. So having this kind of distance. Um, in that sense, I find out that um, the way I want to call aesthetics come from Spanish. If you have this word without the hyphen, it means aesthetics in Spanish. But I decided to put a hyphen on it. So basically by putting the hyphen, I have created the word it is, because Latin est, it is ethics. So for me, aesthetic, it is the way by which you create a kind of ethical ecosystem that confronts the reality people in power are trying to impose. So one example of this, so it's not so abstract, is a project I did in New York where um, it's called Immigrant Movement International. And I'm going to give you one, um, one example. Um, the people, we have worked with undocumented um, people for a long time. And uh, uh, for me, the goal is not what kind of art they do or how good they feel or how, how amazing the photos are. For me, the goal is how can this group of people can define themselves as political subjects in a place where that is not allowed. And one example is this. They went to a community um, board uh, to, to ask for, uh, you know, sa safety for their kids and the bicycle, <coughs> something very simple, bicycle lines. And this woman who is a racist, she uh, stopped them. Of course, uh, Mr. Trump was in power. Um, 
I say, why are you demanding anything when you're going to be deported in a few weeks? For me, the art was not the space. The art we have done was not the space, was not the amazing um, art that has come out of it. For me, the art that we have done in the project is that those women who a few years ago thought they had no right to even be in a place next to a white person, confront this woman, and not only confront the woman, but made a campaign, and they actually expel her for the community board. So I think that's, for me, what as ethic is. How can you create a situation through art where people are so used to be respected, so used to be a different grown up, let's say, with their rights, that when they're in another uh, place, they will ask for it because they know now what they're missing. That's what I want to do with my work. So of course, another element that I use a lot is the idea of how can art be a tool? And I call it arte uti, not only to make people who speak English hard to pronounce arte uti, <laughs> which I enjoy a lot. It's my own personal joke. But uh, let's call it scientifically, it's the colonizing gesture. But, um, but I think very much this idea of art as a tool. It is, it is a little complicated because uh, in these moments where uh, you guys are living maybe for the first time an autocrat and somebody with aspiration of dictatorship, something we're very used to, um, it is interesting that there is a dangerous move where people say, yes, art is a tool and we can use art. <coughs> I think art is a tool. It should be given to people to enact it, but we have to be careful because one of the things art can do is safeguard the complexity of reality that now is being completely uh, you know, it's a normalization of the banal, it's a normalization of the simplistic, you know, the good and bad, the kind of non complex context. And, and I think we have a lot of challenges in that. Uh, art as a tool is not a toolbox that you say A, B, C, and you do. It is a process of understanding that we have control over the definition of. Um, we have control over the process of defining what is happening to us. We have the control over the process of interpretation of our reality. And we also have the control over what future we want. And we can enact that to, reality, to, to art. I also think part of this is the responsibility of the institutions. I think it is the moment, if you really want to do art that is political, you also need to challenge what is the role of institutions? What are the role of museums? What are the role of art centers? Everybody has to be on board. Okay, journalists, lawyers are already asking themselves, what is our role in this situation? I think museums and institutions has also to ask that. How can they become a, a place that is safe, let's say for undocumented people? How can they start populating their exhibition with maybe saying, okay, yeah, you have three or four famous people because they need that, but making sure that part of the, the, the people they show are maybe, I don't know, undocumented artists, which they are a lot and very good. And how can they help uh, to create legitimacy for an alternative um, aesthetic coming from places that normally are not recognized? Um, the other thing that I feel is extremely important is understanding the political timing in order to do art. How can we understand the political soreness? How can we understand the political emotional moment we're living at? I'm going to give you an example of this because Lo peor de nuestro problema no es su gravedad, sino la falta de perspectiva para solucionarlos. No me atrevo ni siquiera a sugerir una sola solución. Sin embargo, creo que el camino para que las soluciones aparezcan es que micrófonos como este estén a la disposición de todo el que tenga una idea en su cabeza. Para que estos micrófonos se multipliquen y tenga cada uno mayor audiencia, primero hay que despenalizar el ejercicio de la opinión discrepante. El día que en este país se anuncie con toda claridad que ha sido 
sido despenalizada la discrepancia política, seremos testigos de un hecho trascendental. De numerosas gavetas saldrán proyectos económicos, políticos, sociales, culturales y de diversa índole que han permanecido ocultos por temor a ser malinterpretados. Proyectos que habrán sido elaborados por gente seria, profesional, honesta, inteligente e informada, pero que por ser respetuosa a la ley y amante de su familia no han querido ponerse a sufrir las penalizaciones que todos conocemos. Como ventaja adicional, se reducirá la simulación el oportunismo So one of the things I like about this project I did in 2009 was that this is a moment where Fidel was not anymore in the news, where we were used to see him every day, every time, like you see Trump now. And um, although there is a big distance with both people, but, but um, he was away and Raul invited people to say what they think. But of course it was all a theater. So I really like in my work to put propaganda at test, to test propaganda and say, okay, I'm going to take what you say and I'm going to, to do it, to see how you feel about it. And of course they don't like it because propaganda is not the truth. Um, but for me, what is important about this phrase is sometimes as an artist, you think you're doing a great job. You're like, oh my God, I'm doing a great piece, this is great. And then somebody come and say, I hope one day this is reality. So this is also a challenge that we have as artists, to work in kind of hyper-realistic way. Work really inserting ourselves in what is happening, not, not isolating what is happening in a kind of protected bubble, but actually going there and immerse ourselves in those uh, places. And I tried to do that later in 2014. Um, and actually, I tried to stage the same piece, but then in a public uh, space. And it was interesting to, to see what you activate with the piece. I think it's interesting to see and understand that political art has consequences. And as an artist, you have to deal as much as you deal with the aesthetic and the production as you do with uh, the consequences of the work. And the consequences of this is I, together with 83 people, got in jail. Just because we wanted to go to the square and say what we thought about Cuban fusion. And I think we need to be ready for that. Um, it is more complicated than just the news. It's more complicated like, than an applause. It is a very emotional, um, ethical process, but I think it's important that we are um, willing to do it. Of course, this is what I want to transform African political effectiveness, meaning not only uh, blaming people, not only trying to complain, but trying to do something that move forward and trying to change this reality that we have in Cuba, in this case. Um, and also trying to see if one day you have an idea and people don't have to wait for somebody to say start, but they do it themselves. For me, it's very important to see art uh, not as a way to represent a political situation, not as a way to paint an image, but to create political situation. That's what I'm trying to do. When we got in trouble uh, because the Revolution Square, um, I was extremely satisfied as an artist. I was preoccupied as a person, but I was very satisfied as an artist because we created a political situation the government has to deal with. And that's what I think is uh, what my art is trying to do. This is something I'm trying to do. In the process of being detained, I also had uh, quite a few interrogation sessions. Tell them I'm not here. <laughs> uh, and uh, in the interrogation session, something very interesting happening, happened. My interrogator, the piece I presented was called Tattling Whisper. So my interrogation had to go to Wikipedia to learn who Tatling was <laughs> in order to keep interrogating me. 
And that was a very good moment for me because I realized, oh, they can learn through my work. Mm. So I say, okay, let's do that. So I decided in order for them to talk to me, next time they will have to read Hannah Arendt because <laughs> who is basically their autobiography, uh, the origin of Tatarianism. So what I did is I, I, there were several things. This is a quick talk. There were several things. It was the Havana Biennial. I knew that part of the, because you need to know the system. So I knew part of the project the government had with me is to show me to the world as a troublemaker, like crazy lady. Uh, wanted uh, dying for, to be in the New York Times or something stupid like that. And, um, and then I decided to self-surveil myself. So I decided to do 100 hours the whole time of the exhibition, I mean the opening days of the exhibition. And we were f uh, recording every minute of it. And rightly so, the only time I went out for an opening of a friend who was a few blocks away, they didn't let me to enter the National Museum on the, the justification that they knew I had gone to another exhibition to make trouble. And I say, no, because I have my own surveillance and I can give it to you and it's dated. So I didn't go anywhere. So I think it's important to, not to put the police in your head, but understanding how they work. So in this case, my main um, logro, what I think I, I, I achieved here, is that they had no way to stop me because it was in my house. I put a, a speaker to the, to the street so people can hear Anna Ren a few blocks away because sound is spread freely. So the response is they brought this brigade <laughs> of people with the hack jammers to, to go exactly in front of my house. And they were not subtle at all. They actually went from the beginning to the end of my house. And that was it. Um, it is interesting because I stop. I mean, sometimes you need to understand where you have to stop fighting and wait for your opportunity. And then, of course, because they respect the labor laws in Cuba, they had to stop for lunch. <laughs> so I read them uh, a section about col collaborating with the police uh, during lunchtime. And of course, they leave at 4.30, so I keep talking the whole night. So yeah, so that's what I mean. We need to understand that, uh, and this is their artwork. <laughs> Um, and it's funny because after, in some of the news, we, we said they did only our house. They came two days later to do a little bit more, just to show it's not true. <laughs> so, so I think for me the important thing is that art needs to anticipate instead of react. Thank you so much. <laughs> so, um, hello everyone. Hi. Hi. Uh, it's good to be here. Thank you for inviting us here. Also, thinking and picking up where Tanya left off, we believe that it's important for artists to be visionary and not reactionary. And to, although we must contend with the past, to really look towards the future and to be asking questions, not trying to answer them. And in that, I think both my work and Eric's work is really about engaging um, and wrestling, engaging the public, but also wrestling with things that are unsure about how to answer or how to resolve. And a democracy is a, is, is a good one to start. And <laughs> this piece is a, a, a canvas that is made up of prison uniforms, orange striped mm -hmm. prison uniforms. And I, I, I use them to create a maze the, to read out the first three letters of the preamble to the Constitution, we the people, and finding that that foundation of the words to be, uh, they've always haunted me because they say so much with so little. And also, uh, in this land of the free where we, who was included in the we, <laughs> when, the mm -hmm. we were, when we were founded, um, and who, was, who were the people, but also in the 21st century where we imprison more people than anyone else in the world. Mm. Um, and for many people, there is this impossible maze to avoid or, or um, inc incarceration or to find pathways towards freedom. 
I, I, certain texts from historical moments often inform my work. I, I, I see myself as a visual culture archaeologist, often mm -hmm. looking at images and texts from the past and trying to find ways to present it anew, much like museums do. And uh, this is a series of paintings based off of a 1968 photograph by Ernest Withers, who uh, was documenting Memphis sanitation workers holding signs that said, I am a man, uh, when they were protesting segregation in the workplace. And I found that astounding because I grew up in an era where the f catchphrase wasn't I am a, a man, it was I am the man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I found it kind of interesting to consider how it went from a relatively selfish statement uh, during post-integration from a collective statement after segregation. And I like to read the last line as a poem where it says, um, I think the top line as a timeline almost of American history, where people like me were counted as three-fifths of a human being mm -hmm. and, and different uh, social movements. But I'm the man, who's the man? You the man, what a man. I am man, I am human, I am many, I am, am I? I am, I am, I am, amen. And that ultimate revelation is that our greatest gift is our consciousness. And one of the reasons that we work together, but also work with other artists is because we see the magic that artists can create with just so, so little. So the space in between uh, where you can make a statement or make, make an impact with just one person, but that will have a revelation for others who uh, become awoken and, and conscious. And other projects that are collaborative, like the Truth Booth, which is a form of a modern day confession booth which my friends and I created as a way to invite members of the public to share their own wisdom and knowledge, where we traveled it to about five different countries and 35 states. And last year we're in Detroit and uh, we're always, what happens, people go in and they say, uh, the truth is, and then they speak for the next two minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, there, uh, we found that it doesn't matter uh, class, gender, culture, age, everyone has something incredible to offer and, and different insight that can influence the way that we shape the world and, and, and navigate through it. And then another photograph that I turned into a sculpture in this case was based, uh, was a photograph of miners being strip searched by Ernest Cole, who was a South African photographer photographing the kind of, the, the devastation and the oppression of apartheid and uh, was able through his work, which was smuggled out of the country to show a different side of, this, of that story of an American ally. And this was, I always felt guilty looking at this image of the miners being strip searched because I always saw myself gawking at their butts. And I thought that if I, want, if I remade it, I wanted to crop it and give it a new context. So I cropped it at the shoulders and titled it Raise Up. Mm -hmm. And so giving this image of subjugation a new role of kind of exaltation but then six months after I made the work in 2014, the events, Michael Brown was murdered um, outside of St. Louis, Missouri. And it was seen when I showed it in the United States as a hands up, don't shoot piece. Mm. And I found it to be fascinating about how something that I made about something that happened 50 years ago, halfway across the world could speak uh, mm. very much to something that was going to happen in the future. Uh, in the place that I come from. Mm. <laughs> yeah, and um, I'm Eric Gottesman, and <clears throat> we are sort of going to get very quickly to our project together for Freedoms. But just to give a, a, a little bit of a context in my own work, um, you know, I really relate to the question, so many of the questions, so many of the things you're saying, Tanya. But um, this question of where is the art located, um, you know, I, I we. Actually, I, I didn't start as an artist at all. I started as somebody that was interested in law and uh, started working at the Supreme Court just a few blocks away from here, but mm. eventually um, made my way into photography, which Hank also started in photography. Um, and I think that in photographer, photography, there are these two central concepts that really interested me, which was um, power and value and how where how the relationship between the subject and the photographer um, became a microcosm for all these other relationships of power and how, we, how and where we place social value. Um, and so this first, uh, the first sort of 15 years of my 
work was based uh, in, in one neighborhood in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, um, where uh, I collaborated with a group of kids in that neighborhood. And um, we sort of tried to question the idea of photographic authorship, uh, staged performances, made photographs about uh, their lives, um, also created installations that reimagined who the audience for images from this community were. Um, and so this is an installation based on the, the traditional coffee ceremony in Ethiopian culture um, where uh, people gather and talk about things that are happening in their community. And this installation pulled apart and picked up, you know, packed up in the back of a pickup truck and um, people from the community and I would drive this around to different towns and villages throughout the country and set it up. Uh, and people, you know, the, the sort of image culture in every place is different. In Ethiopia, this kind of public display of images was read as like a, an NGO communication or some sort of propaganda. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when, they're, when, when people would ask questions about what, what are these for, what do they, what do they mean? And, and it was to, you know, there wasn't a specific necessarily like actionable um, goal. It, it, that was part of where the art was located uh, mm -hmm. in, in this work. And then I, I've sort of worked on this in different ways in different communities around the world, um, in, uh, in Lebanon, in Jordan. Uh, this here is in, on an indigenous reserve in Canada where the artist Wendy Ewald and I did a collaborative project uh, reimagining the way in which this community um, of First Nations people, the Innu community, was, was uh, photographed and was imaged. And so the community actually curated their own images and put them up on the, um, on the buildings around them and in the white community nearby. And, and, and these images very much confronted the sort of a mainstream Canadian image of Native culture um, in the sense that they were more complicated, more nuanced, uh, and, and not so easily reduced to this one story. I'm just going to share this last image to say, because I think we might get into this conversation. Evan and Tanya and I started talking about this a little bit earlier. but. In Ethiopia, I, I've, I've still continued to work in Ethiopia, and the, my latest project there is based on a novel written by an Ethiopian minister of propaganda uh, mm. in the 80s under the communist regime who would sit at his desk and write pop propaganda during the day and then go home at night and at his kitchen table write this novel that was critical of the regime for which he worked. <laughs> and so I'm you know, using that novel as a vehicle to talk about free expression in Ethiopia today, where if you see the Ai Weiwei exhibit, there are several portraits of mm -hmm. Ethiopian journalists, journalists Natnail Mekonen, Eskinder Nega, um, Petro Solomon from Eritrea. Uh, so there, there's still this um, context in Ethiopia today of suppression of free speech. I'm sort of looking back to the Ethiopian history of ways of getting around that. And, um, sort of look, getting you know obliquely uh, to um, to speak about the kinds of things that at that time were were censored, um, and so I'm using the novel as a vehicle to engage artists, filmmakers, writers in Ethiopia today to make new works that reflect on that. Um, and it's that kind of fraught relationship to propaganda that I think led us uh, to Four Freedoms. Um, Four Freedoms. Hank and I have known each other for a long time and uh, talked for a long time about our interest, our shared interest in politics and art. Um, you know, uh, from many different angles, both in our work and in our political interests and our political action. Um, I uh, proposed many years ago to Hank that, that we should run a campaign for him to run for office which uh, he didn't bite on. Um, mm. Luckily, Tanya's picking up the... <laughs> Did someone give <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, oh, this is yeah, actually a fundraiser. You're supposed to now give money for the... That's right. Yeah, right. <laughs> we can consult for your campaign. Exactly. Um, but, you know, but, we did, but we were interested in this idea of, of overlapping, um, basically frontally engaging with the political system. Artists are often encouraged to make work that says something about the social systems or in which they exist. And we're supposed to protest, you know, as the artist Laurie Joe Reynolds has said, right up to the steps of City Hall, but we're not supposed to go in and make the laws. Mm -hmm. And so we said, what if we actually did that? 
Um, and what if we engage directly in the political system? So our first step mm. was to create um, a super PAC, which uh, we've co-opted the sort of structures of political campaigning using mm. lawn signs, uh, campaign headquarters, political advertising, and that became our entryway into the project. After we created the super PAC, Hank and I started talking about it in late 2015. So before the election cycle, the 2016 election cycle started heating up, and we didn't know who was gonna be the candidate, and we didn't know who was gonna be elected, um, but we did know that we wanted to sort of insert art and critical discourse into the political discourse. Um, and so one of the first interaction, like activations of the ways that we did that was through uh, a, a show, like an exhibition, at two different spaces in New York at the Jack Shaneman Gallery, um, where we invited artists to be part of an exhibition responding to, um, to these ideas about art and politics. And one of the pieces, um, this is a piece by Dred Scott, the artist Dred Scott, a man was lynched by police yesterday, which is referring to the NAACP flag in 1938 that was hung outside the headquarters saying a man was lynched yesterday, Dred added by police. Um, this created a lot of controversy with the landlord uh, and also in, <laughs> once Fox News picked up the story, um, that became a new element that we had to react to and then it became this very large story that, uh, that eventually the flag had to be placed inside due to uh, some of the pressure that we were receiving. And I, th I think a lot of what we're more interested in is because although we are pretty good artists ourselves. <laughs> uh, we find Great. ourselves uh, to be, like Tanya said, bigger fans of, of other, uh, other artists and the work mm -hmm. of other artists. And so uh, with Four Freedoms, we wanted to really take an opportunity to reframe work that artists are already doing in the lens, uh, through the lens of like civic engagement. And whenever you call something art, it encourages people to think creatively about things that they already know or when you call something political, it implies that there's something at stake. And so having worked, we worked over the course of last year, at least with about um, 100 artists, we worked with at least 40 more this year. And we did, uh, and, and once, one of the projects we did is we were got given access to the photographic archive of a photographer named James Spider Martin, who photographed the Selma to Montgomery march and was there to document that specific m moment where the Alabama State Troopers um, told the, the crowd to disperse. And uh, the, the people on the right are civil rights marchers, including uh, Representative John Lewis and Reverend Josiah Williams. And uh, in this moment where uh, so much of the past seems to be present, uh, and, uh, and uh, reading 1984, where uh, uh, Orwell says, you know, the past. Who controls the past controls the present. Who controls the present controls the future. Uh, when someone says, make America great again, the question is, when was it greater for more Americans than it was mm -hmm. or is today? And uh, for thinking about it amongst ourselves, all the, the one time that we could think that it might have been greater uh, was during the Civil Rights Movement when every day, uh, largely disempowered people through strength, beauty, dignity, courage, and creativity um, forced uh, the hand uh, of, of the government, but also the hands of the, of, of the people to uh, react to um, incredible suppression that in, that in the spirit that is very un-American. And we're really thinking a lot about how we can use the, uh, the beautiful terms that kind of a lot of our country was framed on, freedom, equality, justice, and uh, also looking at Presidents like Norman, like Norman Rockwell, <laughs> like Franklin D Delano Roosevelt, who said in 1941 in his State of the Union address that everyone was entitled to four basic freedoms, freedom of speech, freedom from fear, freedom of worship, and freedom from want. And uh, in 1941, uh, that meant if you were a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant male, mm -hmm. and maybe woman, <laughs> uh, but in a much more heterogeneous uh, culturally, ethnically, class, and um, and uh, socially, United States, what does it mean to be for freedom? 
And that, that means that we have to make space for freedoms that we don't necessarily agree with. So even work that we, and artists that we invited to be in our exhibitions aren't necessarily artists that speak for us, mm -hmm. but we think that their voice is as relevant as ours in anything. We were also able to find some of these, uh, we'll get to, to, to borrow some of these posters that Norman Rockwell made referencing uh, FDRs for freedoms, but then were later co-opted by the Office of War Information to sell war bonds. So we see curious mm -hmm. things like uh, save freedom of worship by war bonds. <laughs> and we were able to juxtapose them with various work of various artists in our um, headquarters. Yeah, <laughs> this was the exhibition that we opened with and it, it became a sort of uh, hallmark of our head. We created a headquarters within the exhibition itself. So we had interns and staff working out of this exhibition uh, as, a, as a real super pack. And then Camille and Janan Rashid's text work was used to kind of co counter some of the statements. So purchase the proper, bo proper boots w with which to pull yourself up by the bootstraps, um, you know, with freedom from wants. And then, more, and then another part of our project has been doing town halls at museums uh, where we uh, engage members of the public and artists and... Yeah. One, one thing on what Tanya was saying about, about um, institutions and the new, neutrality, you know, museums are not neutral, mm -hmm. museums are not apolitical, although it's interesting because we are a super PAC and we are artists and so sometimes um, curators want to ask us to do something but then when the legal team of the museum gets involved it becomes a different question because it's like oh are you doing something political and then so that raises this question of what is political and what are we doing here mm -hmm. as a super PAC are we a real super PAC trying to operate in that way mm -hmm. or are we artists performing this kind of thing um, co-opting the structures that mm -hmm. are available to us as political tools um, this, this is one of the um, billboards that we did recently at the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, and I guess, um, yeah, let's Excellent. end it there. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I want to start um, actually with one of the images that you put up a moment ago, which was in some ways the billboard that if people didn't know about Four Freedoms before, they know about it now, and that was the billboard mm -hmm. that showed um, make America Great Again. Would you talk a little bit about, Eric and Hank, would you guys talk a little bit about what the reaction was mm. to that billboard? What happened? Mm. Where was it? Uh, how did you put it up and what happened? Well, it was in Pearl, Mississippi, which um, we, we had originally wanted to put it in Selma, Alabama, but, um, you know, it was a, it, it, we, we, there were no billboard spaces available in that area, so we just sort of went along the highway until we could find a place. The we highway that the marchers marched yeah. on, which is Route 80. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we um, we put it up, and actually, Hank and I both were at a conference in South Africa. Well, we put it up, and then the Trump was elected. Yeah, yeah. right. We put it up <laughs> October 15th. Yeah. October. And then there's no cause and effect there. I don't yeah. think you were. <laughs> so you put it up in when? Before the election. October 15th. And yeah. and and it was part of a billboard campaign that went up in 12 different states, and there was no press about it until a week after the election, when we were both in South Africa. Well, not just us, our whole team was in South Africa, yeah. so there was literally no one to respond. <laughs> like, so like, someone was like, I, I keep getting these calls from uh, the media, what do you, you guys want to answer? Eric and I like, no, we're fine, <laughs> you got it. He's like, I really think you guys should, and we found out that, uh, especially the black press in, Mississippi was really up in arms because a right-wing organization was encouraging mm. police violence by putting up this billboard. Yeah. And that was probably the furthest from our mind, but what happened was the election, after the election there was a lot of anxiety that was, and also a lot of people who were <laughs> emboldened um, because of the perception of um, what that election meant. And all of a sudden we were like, uh, first, how do you contend with, yeah people feeling that your work was actually putting people's lives in danger. Hmm. And we didn't know, it, because we weren't there and we weren't responding, a lot of the first press that came out was like, mysterious super PAC puts right. out this you know, right. thing. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and so there was a lot of ambiguity where, where yeah, like some of, the, some of the press we got was assuming certain things. We got a lot of likes from sort of pro-Trump people, wow. you know. Um, 
So it was. But with a lesson behind it, though, was then we did get to speak to the uh, press as, as far as Seattle, but also, um, especially with Seattle. a lot of the, uh, which I was surprised and happy to see that there was so much yeah. black press in Mississippi, which people read, you know, and because it was a way in which to, to, to change the conversation by, you know, and then, but also three different local news channels, uh, mostly picked up by the, the African American journalists. Mm. There, um, who did not feel like it was art. I mean, mm. a lot of us. Well, that's the question, was, right? Yeah. Yeah. But what happened though is like, and when this one woman called from a doctor, she worked in a doctor's office, and she was like, "You guys might be well intentioned, but you're not from around here, and wow. you're doing mm. terrible things." Mm. Um, and like, I was like, and we were like all at a table, like, uh, <laughs> and I and I had the epiphany though in that moment of like, uh, well, I think Eric said it, and I was like. Well, to like actually take it out of my mouth to the first, but like in order for you to actually look at that image and believe that it's supporting police brutality, you have to see the people with the batons as the protagonist. Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. the way that we had always seen the images, the people who were, um, were attacked by the police were the, were the heroes and the, the, the police might've won the battle, but, the, but because of that, they lost the war. And so there was like this way in which uh, their defiance and then they, they, the young, the, the power of the youth who with peace and, and, all, the, and all these incredible strength actually, you know, Martin Luther King wasn't there that day, you know, and because they were willing to face up the, the, the scariest of the scariest of, of oppressors, they, they opened doors for all of us. And I think that revelation for, for the other people were like, yeah, that, that, that was us. Mm -hmm. I, I was part of that moment. And, and people started to really see that, yeah, they even in their times of greatest fear, coming together and also and being the beautiful, intelligent, and, 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 and loving people that, that they were can actually always conquer hate. And so that was like, and so that narrative got picked up. And so by the time it was on CNN and New York Times, it was a different story, but it was a close one. <laughs> yeah, I will read a headline that was on CNN, which was Mississippi residents unsure of controversial billboards intent. <laughs> <laughs> which in some ways, I mean, that was kind of success in every way, in the mm -hmm. sense that you didn't necessarily say to everybody, here's what you're going to believe. Mm -hmm. But you, you, threw, you threw something into, the, into our cultural moment, and you said, begin, proceed. Yeah. Be and unsure. Mm -hmm. Did you follow up with the pro-Trump-like people? Well, there's actually, not really, but, but there, there have been several videos posted on YouTube that I've stumbled across that are sort of researching each of our, and, our, and some of our donors' pasts. Like, mm. really, like, trolling deep into our, so, you no. Should, you but should we have should. infiltrated them. I mean, that was a great opportunity. Yeah. 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 You yeah. maybe need to invite entry. them to an event where they can meet other people that have liked the images. Well, we, we have the actual billboard, and it's, it's going to Kentucky in March, and is then it? we're bringing it back to Mississippi, I think, at the Mississippi Museum of Art next year, possibly. Yeah. It's not final yet, but and that might be an opportunity to yeah. do that. When I was explaining to somebody, and we're going we're, we're gonna to turn to something that Tanya mentioned in a moment, but I was explaining to somebody earlier today what you guys created with Four Freedoms. And they asked me, is it a super PAC or is it a super PAC? Mm. Like, uh, and you, you, you posed that question of yourselves. Talk to me about what your intention was. Were you actually creating an organization for the purposes of doing conventional political activity? Or were you commenting on the artifact of our time in which we have these instruments and these strange tools of politics or a little of both? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, th I, think, I, think, I think all of that um, and uh, I mean, what was interesting is to learn, to really get into the weeds about like, what those different things are and why um, a super PAC working with a museum is problematic. Mm. Or, um, but also to see like, that super PAC, you know, that all this stuff is so <laughs> dirty, you mm -hmm. know? I mean, like, and it's so easy to get around, even though there are laws that delineating like, what kind of speech you're supposed to do with what mm -hmm. kind of organization. You know, um, we wanted to use the vehicle. We we are a real super. We're registered with the FEC mm -hmm. and the IRS, but 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 we wanted to mess with that, um, in in part to create that kind of unsureness that you're talking about. To build the idea that nuance is part of 
nuance could be a valuable um, tool in political discourse. Mm -hmm. Tanya, one of the things that comes through very clearly in your work mm -hmm. is the splendid subversive power of humor. And I was reminded <laughs> yes. as, as yeah. I was looking at a couple of your pieces that there's a moment uh, when I read about this for the first time in China made a lot of sense to me, which is that right after the revolution had succeeded, the People's Republic of China had been founded, and some of the new apparatchiks were going through and taking stock of society and figuring out what needed to be done. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they identified very early on as a big problem was humor, because humor <laughs> was a persistent challenge <laughs> to the revolution. And so they formed a committee, which was called the Committee oh, wow. for the Revision of Humor. <laughs> And yes. what they did was okay. they began... Next, they, next research. Right, exactly. I mean, it, and so then they, they, and they went after essentially what was the equivalent of Chinese stand-up comedy, which was this kind of um, sort of these, these two-man acts. And, they, um, and they, they banned certain kinds of jokes mm. and so on. And they said that the humor had to be in service of the revolution. And Lowen, you can see where this is going. The humor was not so humorous afterwards, <laughs> after the committee's <laughs> heroic efforts. Um, I'm curious about what role people use humor for in Cuba today? And does, in fact, the government have a sense of humor? Yeah. Well, I, I, I have well, several things. I have my, my, the way I work is I laugh after. Uh -huh. <laughs> Meaning, I think it's very dangerous to laugh before. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is, is dangerous. For me, it's not so productive to laugh at the people in power. For me, it's interesting to laugh at what you can do to people in power. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's what I mean by laugh, laugh after, you know. So to do, a essentially, to do a provocation. It's not about provocation. It's about how can you make them look inefficient and silly. Mm. You have to do your work for that. It's not just saying, oh, he looks weird, his hair is not nice, you know. Mm. It's more about how can you make that person unstable in power. Mm. And then that's a great laugh, but they don't like that laugh. Mm. <laughs> and um, and I think they it's very interesting because in Cuba there was a lot of um, uh, chistes, there was a lot of um, jokes in the streets that we were certain were created at the Communist Party Central Committee. Some intended of, uh, as an internal political we thing? We have a lot of speculation is that somebody there that saw something and is making a joke and there's somebody here and then keep it, or this is something that has been put in the streets hmm. for people to release a little bit, hmm. you know, their tension. So it is extremely interesting. There were mostly sh uh, jokes about a Cuban, a Soviet, and a Chinese, and an American. So yes, mm -hmm. maybe they did it. <laughs> So I don't remember any right now, but uh, it sounds better in Spanish. I think. Yeah, also it's hard to translate, but um, but I think it's interesting because they they are losing their sense of humor definitely. Do you think um, somebody because pointed out? Because they're afraid. I think now they're more afraid, and when you are afraid, it's hard to laugh. Mm. You mentioned your interrogators before. Uh, did you ever find that in in your encounters with the state mm. that you found people who agreed with you, or people who came to understand what you were doing, or people who could laugh at the jokes that you were making about them? I, during the interrogation session, nobody laughs. Yeah. But, um, and they were quite intense, but I say in my last one, which was last month, uh, I was in the middle of the interrogation, the one that interrogated me all the time, Kenya, who has become like a celebrity character because everybody knows about her and she's interrogating all the people. And it makes, um, so in the middle of the interrogation, she was screaming at me, like in a very, I was sitting, she was in front of me, like very aggressive. And I look at the guy who say he's a colonel from the secret police, and I was like, I look at him and say, I'm bored. <laughs> <laughs> in the middle of the interrogation. <laughs> so I think that was my moment of um, humor, but they didn't get it. <laughs> so. Or maybe sure. he was too scared to show that he got it. No, I don't think it's just like, you know, it's, it's more to show them like it's not working anymore. So I think, um, yeah, I think Fidel was very good at mm -hmm. laughing. He was very smart and he was really good at um, understanding mm -hmm. how to, to transform one thing into another. 
which is that, what that jokes mean, you know, like that's what the humor means. And um, do you find that your work is understood by a wide population or is it, ambigu is it ambiguous or do people, I'm thinking back to the billboard where you mm -hmm. had essentially a variety of different reactions mm -hmm. depending on where people were coming. When you ask people come to the, to the square and say what you think, I think it's very clear. Mm -hmm. What happened after is not so clear. And my work is about the behavior, the reaction people have. Um, so what happened after is complicated because there is a fight between the governor and me about what the intent is, like you had. They want to define my work and I want to defend my right to define my work. Mm. So it is interesting because at some point I accuse them of robbing my authorship of mm. the work. I'm like, you're taking my authorship. Intellectual like, property Intellectual violation. property, <laughs> which they didn't get either. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so I think, yeah, I think it's, it's more for me, the complexity is not so much the interpretation of the work, it's more how people are able not to situate themselves in the proposition. Mm -hmm. And what it means for people to do the step to be in that proposition. Mm -hmm. I'm curious what you guys saw looking at Tanya's work about Cuba. What's the shared DNA here? What's going on that you see there that's relevant for what you're doing here? Is there anything that you think is in common? I mean, so I, I see so much. Um, I mean, Tanya's, been, Tanya's work has been way ahead of the game for so mm -hmm. long. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, we were just talking about the piece at the Tate where you had a horse with, uh, mounted police, yeah. Yeah, mounted police roaming around this lobby at the Tate, creating this like looming sense of fear and terror, mm -hmm. uh, you know, in a space that's supposed to be uncontested. I mean, I think, I think this idea of like inserting the idea of um, uh, risk and discomfort. Um, into ordinary spaces, into spaces where that maybe we just drive by on the highway, or um, you know, mm -hmm. that that's something artists are especially supposed to be good at, you know, like um, becoming uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And there's that doesn't happen um, in the same way in political discourse. So I, I think that's something that we're trying to generate. Well, in a way, too, we live in this time in which we are all able to engineer our own comfort in yeah. all of these additional ways. You can sort of create your own personal music space. You don't have to, if you don't want to see articles that you don't agree with, you don't have to. Yeah. Um, and so in a sense, it puts, it creates greater opportunity for an artist to sort of disrupt the quietude of our own little bubbles. I think one thing that I, I feel is important to say that the difference between a provocateur, which I hate when people say you are a provocateur, and an artist who is political, is that the provocateur just disrupt and leave. Mm -hmm. And the political artist disrupt and stays mm -hmm. to have the conversation and to, and to have a follow up yeah. with whatever and has happened. A, has yeah. a stake in it. They have skin yeah. in the game. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm, one of the things that is, seems to be persistent across time and across space is propaganda, just the idea of propaganda. And you know, the irony, of course, is that propaganda can also be art, and in many cases... Bad art, yeah. Yeah, I mean, some, it's <laughs> venal, it's malignant, it's, mm -hmm. it's problematic. Reduced. Yeah, and it's didactic, it sort of tells you what to think in some ways. Um, but why do you think, I, I've always wondered about propaganda. I had a conversation once with a Chinese kind of uh, very uh, sort of a, the, the equivalent of the Chinese alt-right, essentially a young, very, very conservative guy. And he said, you know, in my culture, at least we know that we're brainwashed. You don't even know that you're brainwashed in your culture. <laughs> you think you're free. And I actually said, actually, you may be right about that. That's an interesting idea. I'm curious about that. Why is it that propaganda is such a persistent element of how we live? Well, I want to give you an example. I think the best propaganda, propa propaganda gesture ever in the history of propaganda, in Cuba at least, let's not be generic, is that Fidel mm. never had a statue. Mm. He forbid mm. to have a statue of himself anywhere. 
and he doesn't allow, I mean, you can have photos of him, like, you know, that's it. You cannot have a statue, so you cannot have his name on any factory or any school or anything. And that's brilliant. Mm. That's the biggest part of propaganda because he's inside of everybody, every one of us. Mm -hmm. So his propaganda was not to show you and, and persist by the insistent visual presence, but to go inside your emotional constructed world. And that's, I think, mm. why he left us. With. Why do you think he, what was the actual, thi what, what did he say was the reason he didn't want to have statues made of them? I don't, I don't know the answer. Mm. I don't want to say something I'm not sure about. Mm. But uh, he was very clever about it. He, he, and also, it doesn't matter what he say because he was lying all the time. He was mm -hmm. like making whatever you want to hear all the time. Yeah. So, and he would not say the real reason. This sounds reason. familiar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I and he would not say the real reason, probably. But I, there are people who I say that he did it so there was that. no, <laughs> yeah. There are people who say he did it so there are no statues to take down. Mm. Mm. Well, he may, actually, that's an interesting That's a good point. Idea. Yeah. Saddam yeah. might have actually learned something. From a lot of people no, should have yeah. learned from him. Why do you, do you think, I mean, what's interesting, you guys are actually now in the propaganda game, mm -hmm. brilliantly. I mean, what you're doing in some of these pieces are, and I should point out here, an interesting element is that in Chinese, the word for propaganda and publicity is the same, mm. and it, it persists, it drives the government crazy because they say, we are the publicity department. I'm like, nah, you're the propaganda department. <laughs> like, we're the publicity. So, but actually, That's there's good. something to that, that, you know, let's... I own it. I mean, I'm a propagandist for my own ideas, I suppose, on the page. Which is probably the, what's the most important thing. I think the, yeah, I think in, 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 in Cuba and in China, there's uh, government authored uh, propaganda, and here we have corporate op authored mm. government sanctioned mm -hmm. propaganda. Mm -hmm. And I don't know which one is most more insidious, you know, mm -hmm. because we don't recognize uh, how much propaganda that we are consuming um, on a daily basis because advertising is seen as benign, it's seen as a service, mm -hmm. um, but it really is a, a form of social conditioning and, and control. Uh, and, um, you know, whether it be the way I talk to my mom, um, that's a, 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 it's a corporate or, you know, the, the Smithsonian was, it was founded as, a, you know, <laughs> yeah. we wanted to be seen as a serious country and serious countries have right. national museums, right. and they should be free for us to show all the cool stuff that we have and yeah. that we create. So you know, propaganda is is everywhere, and I don't know if there's. I don't want to fight propaganda, but I do want to have my own, add my own two cents mm -hmm. <laughs> into it because I think um, my second language, our, all of our second, is 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 media. Mm -hmm. You know, like I I can I I can. At least I can translate it without even knowing I'm hearing it, but I'm, I feel like it's important for us to also speak it because, mm -hmm. and not just speak it in the, in the interest of selling a product, but also selling you know, new ideas. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where we're really hoping to kind of create the space and not by us doing it, but by really just saying, reframing the work of other artists that maybe now like that, that piece of dreads, which uh, was at, Jack Shaman Gallery is now hanging in the Whitney, mm. which I know that it would not have been there if it had not been seen because it was too it was too dangerous, mm. Mm. you know. And I think a lot of th exciting things about our time is that things that were once uh, seen to be too risky now seem necessary mm. to to contend with and to do. And so I think. Um, although we would have been happier like drinking our lattes and kicking it, mm -hmm. uh, I think there is this uh, way in which now uh, we're trying to figure out how to help use the lattes to keep us awake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, because, uh, and, and, there, and, there, that, and how do you use, con so we were saying that we feel like four freedoms needs to be part of the problem. So we want to be at the intersection between art, commerce, politics, and education. Because uh, all of them are very central to uh, the way that we navigate the world, but there aren't very many places where they actually intersect consciously. Hmm. But it is, it is, I mean, something you said, Tanya, it, when you were talking about the possibility of um, sort of disruption when other people are involved in the work. I think, I think art <clears throat> as propaganda 
you know, art, yes, art as propaganda, whether it's Norman Rockwell or, um, you know, uh, anything, <laughs> um, is, is, can be instrumentalized by power. But, um, you know, I, I think I have this naive idea that, like, there can also be the possibility that art disrupts that or that there can be the possibility of, like, collective mm -hmm. surprise as a result of and production I, of art. And I think one thing not to trash completely propaganda is that <laughs> propaganda has some sort of aspirational mm -hmm. aspect mm -hmm. um, that is presented as noble. The problem is that propaganda narrows the possibility to arrive at that moment in a, saying like this is the only way you can arrive. Mm -hmm. And the problem for me as an artist is I love propaganda because I love to take, as I said before, to put it a test and say, okay, I'm going like, for example, in the interrogation session, I, I, I am a revolutionary. I just have a different idea of what the revolution is. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I am actually, right now, um, activating all of the elements, ideological elements of the revolution in the first 10 years of it. Mm -hmm. You know, all the aspiration, the idea of everybody's equal, where now it's not true. Mm -hmm. Uh, there is uh, racial equality, which now is not true anymore in Cuba, that everybody, you know, have the same right for space. All of these things are what define the revolution. But when you try to be a revolutionary and to be a propagandist, let's say, inactive, then it's a problem. You guys, thank you for the work you're doing. Uh, all of you, please join me in thanking this amazing group of artists. Thank <laughs> you.